you have spent more than two decades studying and analyzing risk, philosophy, math, practical problems with probability. You also teach at NYU. You're a distinguished professor of risk engineering. Many of you know Nassim for his many rides in the market. <laughs> that includes the Black Monday of 1987. That includes 2008. And that includes the dot-com bubble. Many people, when they interview Nassim, want to talk about the past. And of course, he is an advisor, as Brandon said, to Universa. But instead of talking about the past, I want to talk about today. I want to talk about Thanks. today, and I want to talk <laughs> come back. Cheers. Uh, not to erase your profound history up here, but you know we are in a profound moment here in markets. And your colleague, Mark Spitznagel, when he spoke to investors, when he wrote to investors recently, and it was actually the number one story on Bloomberg today, we had written about it. He had said, we are living in the greatest tinderbox time bomb in history, greater than the 1920s. And I want to know, you know, do you agree? Okay, so the, the whole thing is on Bloomberg. You attributed the idea to me when it came from Mark. So you got to reverse now and make sure it's Mark's idea, but I share it. Okay, so it's not like uh, it came from me. But so let's go back and figure out what has happened last 15 years. Um, I, I see many young people here. <sighs> And I'm sure those who don't have gray hair um, or are not having lost their hair, those who want to hide it, um, don't know what interest rates are. <laughs> so so let, let's start from the beginning. Now let's start with finance 101. Okay. Finance 101 is what is happiness equals positive cash flow. So, all right. So uh, but that notion disappeared mysteriously in 2008. So let's go back. What happened then? What happened then, 2008, is right after Universa was formed. And uh, on an excellent 2007, 2008 market collapse. So for us, it's a different, it's a good memory. I mean, good memory in the sense that uh, it was financially good. But uh, in New York City, you could see in faces that was things were not good. And then the Federal Reserve somehow, extremely amateurishly, decided that lowering rate to zero would fix the problem. So they put interest rates at close to zero, effectively at zero. Sometimes, you know, interest rates really were negative, as in many places, including Europe. I know because I had an account in Europe. Interest rates at zero are not proven to be more effective than interest rates at 3%. But guess what? Once you put them at zero, it's very hard to raise them. What did interest rates at zero bring? Tumors. Okay. What is a tumor? It's an organism that grows without control because it's uncontrolled. and no mechanism to bring it back to what it should be. You have Bitcoin, but you also have something called real estate. You know, you know, real estate, you go, you buy a house, and then someone else bids higher for your house, and then you feel rich and you go and spend the money. And then someone else bids higher for your house, and then you borrow against. So there's something called interest rate at zero and something called real estate that created illusory wealth of over $100 trillion. So what happened? They fixed an economic problem, naming too much debt in 2007, with what? With more debt. They, they fixed an economic problem with a monetary solution, which is supposed to be a short-term thing. So people invoke Keynes, Schmeis, Keynes himself understood that it was a temporary measure. Most deficits. And even those who understood monetary policy, it's not meant to be a structural correction. Structural correction would have been to turn debt into equity, but the old fashioned way. You go bankrupt, then you have new owners, and then history continues. And that's life, like nature. So the problem is a lot of people have bad habits. So let me ask you you've been at Bloomberg now for a decade, more than a decade. All the people you've met, belong to that category 
of interest rate naive people. So um, let so. me put it into the words that you've used. I was going to use bubbles, but you're using tumors. So these are kind of less than things that have you know inflated to the point that they burst, but a, a larger burning issue that might take a while, it sounds, to sort out. To the extent that there are tumors that are uh, uh, great in society still, in the markets that people are not seeing clearly, what are they? Uh, okay, let's let's simply uh, yeah we we'll get derive the, the 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 answer from looking at how things you know are taking place currently. In the old days, you start a company, and when you got listed on New York Stock Exchange after having two positive, that was the old days. Again, when. Uh, okay, came back. The um, so you made money when your company simple. And then look at the billionaires because Bloomberg has a hobby of listing billionaires. Nobody cares about billionaires. He is no longer his number twenty three. He was twenty four. Maybe next year, less four. No, but anyway. But so, but look at these billionaires. How does they become rich? They become rich from valuation, not from cash flow. You see, so you got rich over that period by funding, oh, third round, now the company is worth 2 billion. It's all paper, for God's sake, it's paper. So that modus is gone. They don't realize what's going on because it takes a while and because they don't have the education. When you spend 15 years in that environment, you don't know finance. So they don't realize what's hitting them. So you have to go to people who are either have gray hair or happen to have a library or have a grandfather, grand uncle, great grandfather, someone, someone to talk to because to see what's happening, it is much worse than you think. Okay. So all these companies were using the stock market and or private or and or some round 21 investor or okay, as what well, as cash machine. You want cash? No problem. Round whatever. We get cash. Oh, the company now is valued more. Okay, and everybody's happy or was happy. So now you got to make money. We see it was Twitter. This uh, fellow bought that uh, com that company, Twitter. You know, okay, but the, the brilliant financial mind. So, but the you know, and now he he learned about cash flow. You know, <laughs> they have to make that you have to pay pay the rent to something like that. It, it doesn't come from, you know, uh, it doesn't rain money anymore. So to that end, uh, Twitter is one example you're giving yeah. of, uh, you know, the, the great reality of cash flow. But where else are you seeing the big problems that have not yet come to roost? I think the reason this question is important is because we are coming off the worst year in the stock market in over a decade. It's okay, over a decade. This is, uh, you know, we don't look at it. This, this is a blip. It's not even a serious thing. So what I think is happening now is... Well, I don't know if you know, uh, I mean, uh, about bleeding, you know, experience bleeding. I'm sure you haven't because you're alive, people here, but usually when people start bleeding, they lose blood at period T plus one. They have less blood at T plus one than it did at period T, you see? And so now we have a phase of bleeding. What is bleeding? It means earning less than 4.75% because that's where short-term interest rates are. So if you're earning less than, say, about 5%, you're losing money. You have to borrow money. you got to pay 5% plus whatever is premium. And if you can find someone foolish enough to lend you. Right. So that discount rate now is between 4 and 6%. So think about what we're facing now. That's called bleeding. Because if you're not making that, you're not making money. Not only you have to make money, but you're gonna make more than that discount rate. The, sec the second problem, this was a lot worse, is that people think that the Fed having raised rates has engaged in a temporary measure. No, no, Donald Trump is here, around here. He's not in the White House, okay? So the Fed is not, the Fed is gonna keep raising rates 
for keep rates higher than zero, okay? Because they discovered that zero interest rate policy doesn't work. And another thing that people don't realize is that zero interest rate policy seemed to create some cosmetic growth, but it created a lot of inequality. And now people are talking about inequality. Who made money? Those people you see out there in the restaurants in Miami overpaying for uh, for uh, for microscopic sushi. You can see it on the plate. So all these people, the people who made money, it, it created inequality because we had an asset-based inflation. All these years, assets were inflating like crazy. It's like a tumor, I think, is, is the best explanation because that's typically what happens to organisms. You're happy with the growth, but uncontrolled growth, and then boom. Yes. So before we get to inflation, that's another big topic. I want to kind of hinge on this idea that cash flow, this reality that cash making money matters finally, yes. once again, because you look at the number, and I'm going to steal from Torsten Slock over at Apollo, this number of companies in just the Russell that have grown that do not make money yes. versus what they were 30 years ago. And so do you think that this means, I'm going to steal from your colleague, Mark Spitznagel, do you think that the stock market then is the tinderbox time bomb? Do you think that I equities... think, okay, so let me tell you again, let me put it in a framework because this is Universal, there's Universal here. Our strategy at Universal does not depend on what we think of the stock market. So it doesn't change whether Brandon believes that it's going to be rosy forever and Mark, you know, or whatever. It doesn't, or if you think that so. So the strategy here is not about timing markets or environment. There's a structure policy of having geometric payoffs in the tails. But to go back to the environment, I believe that the stock market is way too overvalued for interest rates that are not 1%. So unless they miraculously bring back interest rate to one, which they won't be able to, you will have interest. I mean, it's unsustainable. Why should you put your money in the stock that gives you 2% dividend yield, if you're lucky, when you can get 4.75% from the bank? while playing golf, explain to me right, so the, the logic, right? So, so this is why the stock market has to adjust to normal levels. And, and again, we haven't had that much growth over the past 25 years to justify these valuation. So it's just air. So then that's a good point to start to talk to you about inflation and the direction. Yes. There's a there's an idea in the markets that the Fed has started to get more of a handle on inflation than they had a year ago, that finally you're potentially starting to see inflation peak. But do you believe that the Fed has control over inflation to the point that it can come back to a more natural level? I think the, the, the problem is beyond inflation. The problem is the structure of the modern world in which we live. The structure of the modern world is overreactive because we are, the world is getting more, getting more efficient because of globalization. So it's more reactive. You sell, say, 100 million year one and 100 million year two. Okay. The prices are going to be stable. But if you sell zero year one, and 200 million year two, you're going to have a huge explosion in prices because if you don't sell anything, things shrink and they shrink rapidly, capacity shrinks rapidly, and then you, you have burst. So you have good news and bad news. The bad news is that things react very quickly. Look at what happened, how, how fast that, uh, you know, these prices adjusted up after the, the recovery post COVID. But so the best of bad news, the good news is that all these squeezes resolve in gluts, and this is much faster than in the past. So let me give you an example. 1973, uh, those of you who, I mean, uh, not many were even toddlers then. Anyway, so 1973, there was an oil embargo. So you had a complete change of structure to accommodate higher oil prices. It took till 1981, 23 for oil prices to become soft. 
and then eventually collapsed and it destroyed the Soviet Union. Cars used to be, you know, you could have this party in one car, you know, and then they shrank dramatically, but it took a while. Today, the adjustment for Germany took one year. Putin played his game on Germany, thinking it was 1973, and look, I am, you know, the Pasha. How long it took? Nine months later, you had a glut of gas, natural gas. So the, 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 the adjustments are much faster today. The, the, the price of containers goes up dramatically, and then suddenly... energy and stuff so it's bicycles bicycles we had a shortage when COVID came and guess what now you try to buy a bicycle they give you two with it you know so 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 you have these things so this is why i think that we may have a uh, some softening in many 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 prices maybe not immediately labor but doesn't solve the problem we still will have interest rates higher than two or three percent and we have to go back now to the real world see uh, warren buffett is still alive thank god he will teach us how to invest okay because in the end that's so that's how to do th yes what does that mean in terms of the direction of inflation you're saying that things are starting to come down but do they come down too much too fast there's a view that I either deflation that, or stagflation i think we may have a collapse in many, many prices. Uh, but I mean, I don't want to talk about inflation because it's a naive term. What is inflation if it's the cost of goods and services? Now, now how do you weigh them? Okay. You see how, how what's your, your inflation may be different than mine. The price of wine has gone down because of you, you know, so my inflation is, I have deflation for my goods. You may have inflation for your goods, depending on, and depending on what you're so I, I, when i wrote a paper on bitcoin when people say or inflation i said it depends on the some individuals it depends on preferences it is unstable and has other problems like being short volatility because your basket changes all the time so but overall housing is going to be cheaper uh lumber would be cheaper if you're into lumber right uh, a lot of stuff would be cheaper. Commodities would be cheaper. Uh, but interest rates will not be zero because they, they can't. Can. And, and then there is also a problem here. Um, this debt, all this debt floating around, how does it disappear? How does it disappear? It disappears with the old-fashioned way with a company calling up the creditor to tell them, listen, you know, we have to have a conversation. <laughs> okay, so it's called restructuring. So, so you're going to have, you have a pressure on, and the company has merchandise, they're going to have to find a buyer, and then they call up people, some in the room here may be able to buy them. So well, you're going to have a depression in some prices. So that's just the question, because we have not seen the default cycle pick up yet. We have not seen companies face bankruptcy in the wake of not any yet. of that and amount that's of pressure. Wait, that we're talking about bleeding, now they're losing a drop of blood every uh Every uh, say twelve minutes, a drop of blood, and then we have a long weekend coming and stuff like that. So add add these things up, and you see what's going to happen. So you know you you mentioned a couple here things. The price of some goods will come down, but not all. You've mentioned the idea of wealth inequality being created. So and you've mentioned the idea that uh, certain equities will come back to reality. So at the yes. end of the day, what is the net effect on the, the process? The net okay, the net say? effect. We're going to have normal. Moments. The road to get there would be very painful for some. Uh, and not us, of course, but it would be very painful for people who <laughs> are not <laughs> into tail risk hedging. That's it's, uh, that's a reality. So I, I don't know how we'll get there, but you know, as you know, markets, you know, they have mood and mood swings. I see that. I see people panicking all the time on Bloomberg TV trying to tell you it's, it's all okay, it's all going to be okay. So we're going to have a lot of these people showing up to say, oh, it's all going to be fine, all right? So in other words, things won't be fine for a while. It, the, 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 the situation today, and Mark has pointed it out, we, are, we have more debt than we ever did in history. We have the weirdest valuations in history. And we have, 
a lot more connectivity than we did before. So add these things up and, and realize that, hey, you know what? Disneyland is over. The children go back to school and then make sure you're home. So now we're going to go back to the before. So, so, wonder, so you... how, what, what, I mean, of course, it's not going to be all bad. Uh, you know, it's fine. Enjoy your drink, but it's not going to be uh, uh, as, as, as smooth as it was for the last 15 years. So I'm going to do two things. We're going to talk about two very popular topics in the market today. We're going to yes. talk about Universa. And then we're going to open it up to questions. So have them ready. We'll bring yes. around a mic and you, you can raise your hands and ask Nassim questions on your own as well. You know, you're talking about debt loads. We we're talking about that in terms of corporate America. But there's a lot of hand wringing going on in Washington right now that is taking up a lot of airspace. And I'm wondering, when you look at this big debt ceiling debate, what is Congress missing? Uh, OK, I'm going to be direct. I have no clue. And I don't know how to solve it. I don't think it's important. OK, but I'm... I'm, I'm um, I mean, I share with you that that there is a lot of noise about that ceiling, but I don't think it's material, right? Because I look at you look at the difference between treasury bills and other things, and you realize that U.S. government is still considered a zero risk cr uh, credit, right? So, uh, so I, I so I don't look at uh, what they talk. Washington's a lot of verbs, you know, a lot of sentences, verbs. Uh, TV clips, uh, you know, in other words, something uh, I can't say in polite company, but something associated with, with, with stuff that doesn't smell very well. All right. <laughs> so that's what Washington is. But the prices indicate an indifference to that, that ceiling story. So there but the other so the other one, yes. Oh, the, the, well, there's still questions, though, about whether the question is about the debt ceiling itself or whether the question is about the U.S. debt load and where the United States stands relative to the rest of the world. OK, so let me, let me uh, the good thing is that no. How bad, no matter how bad it's going to be worse elsewhere, OK, because uh, and you can see it, we raise rates. It's bankrupting Egypt, bankrupting all the, the weaker credit countries. It did harm Europe quite a bit. When Brandon went to Italy, it was like 123 euro. And then it was like one what one, one, the big figure changed by the time you know I went to Italy, right? So so like because in a couple of months it was like 98, 97 for me. So do you realize? So I think it's worse elsewhere. It's much worse in Japan. Uh, but they know how to handle it because they they're Japanese, so they have the structure, the social order, all that. Um, but they have a huge amount of debt in Japan. Uh, it's much worse in Europe because they like they like a good life, you know, and 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 they sort of like they they like fables and and ideas. So Europe is a lot worse. Uh, so. So it's going to be good to be here rather than be over there. So the second popular topic yes. then, from real money to digital money. You yeah. mentioned crypto once. We generally know how you feel. About okay, crypto. so I mean, I, I, I just I, don't even have to ask the question. In the beginning, I mean, I hated the Fed so much after 2008 that I, like everyone, thought that crypto was a good idea because it was not the Fed. And then I looked at it and said, that's nonsense. So I wrote something called that people call the Bitcoin black paper now. Is this the boat vibrating a little? Oops. Yeah, okay, yeah, all right. So, so the Bitcoin black paper, in which I explained that Bitcoin was not a hedge against inflation. People say inflation, hence Bitcoin. That if they raise rates, it would collapse because everyone thought that inflation would come, so you have to have assets. No, if inflation would come, they have something called the Federal Reserve that raises rates. So that would harm assets. So, and then Bitcoin would be harmed as well because it was reacting to liquidity. That Bitcoin, if you're into fraud, I'm sure you're not, but let's say one day you wanna be into start doing money laundering or fraud and stuff like that. The last place you wanna be is Bitcoin for that because the transaction is transparent they say it's decentralized and nothing more centralized than Bitcoin. Okay. Isn't that a good thing? Centralized? It means one mistake 
in that blockchain, one flaw because the internet is down in Wuhan or something, right? So the the uh, and then it trickles. One mistake in that system, and Bitcoin goes to zero. So 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 the the whole thing about all these claims about Bitcoin seem to be made to feed people even more naive than those who have been working in finance with zero interest rates, namely teenagers who know a lot about computing and are designed to not understand finance. So that's that's the Bitcoin crowd. So at the beginning, you said you hated the Fed, so you thought you would you would like digital assets, you would like digital currencies. Is no, no, there... I, I thought it was a good idea to be away from the Fed, then I realized that no matter how bad it is, the Fed is... this year no so they can't afford it so nah, but who come here you know and flip-flops is there a world in which you think parts of the system were correct given what you had said at the beginning that part of the crypto you is there anything that there was no to no no i mean it's just i mean you cannot do they say trustless system if you don't trust someone don't do business with him or her <laughs> so whole, the whole idea is, I mean, without trust, you can't build anything. So the whole idea of, of creating a trustless system is, 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 say, plus there's other things that it's too mechanistic. And uh, when I was a trader, we would pick Anglo-Saxon countries for disputes because the law was less mechanistic in Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, London, New York. All right, so you these see, so you don't feel safe with a contract that way. With Bitcoin, with the blockchain, is even more mechanistic. It's unconditional. The thing is done. That's it. You can't reverse. So it doesn't lend itself to transactions. I remember as a trader, we used to have. I don't know, hundreds of errors a week. You cannot make an error on the blockchain. You're done. So the only so. thing more excited than Bitcoin is insurance. <laughs> so we're yeah, going to okay. talk about go. Universa for a second here, yes. because yeah. there are some years where the returns just look so explosive, given yes. your protection against tail risk events. Yes. And, you know, I'm kind of curious about what you're doing in those years. If we look back then at again. 2020, I pro they promised yeah. me that they would give me a little bit of the secret sauce. No, no, no there's no, <laughs> there's no secret. The, we do think all the time. So it's not like, you know, there's uh, going to be COVID, not COVID, this, this, uh, the, the same thing. And they're explosive in the tails. So it's pretty much like an insurance company. And the way people start talking about years to us. And again, Mark and I have a particular allergy for that unit called a year when you're into events that don't happen every year. You see? So you got to look at it on a, like the French have a, uh, the, the five-year plan, the Soviet used to have a 10-year plan, you know, under Stalin, right? So we're on a five-year, 10-year, or 15-year plan. So we look back at the returns of the five years, 10 years, or 15 years. And, and that, this is how we analyze it, because basically our unit of time is different. If events don't happen, if you're trading, you know, uh, uh, I mean, uh, gold or whatever, you're looking at your returns on a daily basis. So your horizon is one day. Ours is stochastic, but typically these events happen every two, three, four, five, six, up to 15 years. So the idea so, is higher returns over time, allowing investors to take on more risk while protecting. Yeah, the so the time. idea we're protecting investors from tail events in a geometric payoff. So over so, five years, yes. the compounded annual growth rate, from what I understand, of Universa would be about... 10.4% over the course of five years. Yeah. But I want to dive into that a little more because obviously those years aren't all the same. When you look at 2020, I want to go back to that time just because the way people made those returns at that time were very varied and it brings us to where we are today. So, you know, we had a story on the Bloomberg Terminal about the almost 3,700% that Universal made in a month over return on invested capital. 
And so I guess my question to you would be, what is the cost of insurance? I mean, to get that kind of return. So let me, uh, let me explain two things. Is this wrong? First thing we saw. No, no, so the the let, let me uh, explain again the, the, the way things we we sold the product or at least it was designed uh, to ensure clients against adverse events. Mm -hmm. So 15 years ago, think about the market has gone up. So net net. You should have been paying for insurance, not collecting. Yet the insurance return, as you can see it over time, as if it were an excellent investment. Okay, so so what do you draw from that? It's a people you, you we, we underestimate the fact that you're not supposed to make money, yet you made all of this. Okay, so why? Be, we work hard at it. We're not going to give now the equations to everyone and stuff like that, except to explain that we have a uh, developed some kind of expertise in designing tail payoffs. And then sometimes the market, and that pays us a lot of money. And when there's no explosions, okay, we talk about something else. So this is, in, in, in a nutshell, how uh, the thing paid off. So when you look at it over a long period of time, it looks like it's correlated to the market. It did very well. It beat the market. And it's supposed to protect you against the market. So it should be negative. So this is the overall story without going into details. Now, 20, 20, 20 uh, 2015, all these are details. And the same structure, look at 2025. 2030 is the same structure. So because we think that there is a fundamental problem in finance, which is that people have taken too many classes in finance department of MBA, uh, in finance you know, of, of, of universities. So basically, they have the wrong metrics to value options. They have wrong ways to look at portfolio. They have modern portfolio theory. They have all these things. They don't work. And we've been banking on that, and things aren't changing. They still teach per, uh, modern portfolio theory. We had the crash of 1987, and the next day they used more of the Gauss distribution than they did before. That doesn't work. Uh, so we think that there are swans that are gray that other people think are black. So what was so, then the difference then between, for example, 2020 when the payoffs were explosive yes. and 2022 when 2022 they were 2022 was not as volatile well as 2020. This is, it is very simple. Paid in a nonlinear way. It's sort of like an insurance that pays you in a little, 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 a lot more. So they, they like think of things in terms of deductible. So, but we, we don't look at it again in terms of this year versus that year, we look at the structure and the way it works over long periods of time. So the other reason this is a relevant debate is because we're here in hedge fund week, they call yes, it a yes. uh, big debate about the value of hedge funds and what they do in a yes. portfolio and which strategies work, uh, whether it's CTAs or whether it's options buying. So why is the option strategy more efficient, more or less efficient than some of the other things you are seeing in the market yeah, that, right now? Let me explain. A lot of people don't know how to value options. When they say efficient, less efficient, for one, you don't know. There's what we call the short-term, uh, and close to the money option, long term, they behave differently. Options are much more than other investments because you have, uh, uh, if you go far in a tail, you have a different payoff. So when people talk about tail risk hedging, it's like saying, oh, we're the zoo animals. The, 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 like you have elephants, you have mice, you have a lot of animals in the zoo. Bit, and we are different from others. Each is different. And we think that we're different than others. And Brandon will confirm, he will tell you that we're a lot, lot better than everyone else. I think he's right, but I don't want to say it uh, directly. So I use him, <laughs> right? Would you say so? No, we're a lot, lot better. And and uh, our performance has been a lot, 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 lot better than 
tailor schedulers and non tailor schedulers. So, so that, that, that's the reality. So what do you say to people in the market? I mean, obviously, there's not, you're not the only one with the view that things could get worse from here. Yes. And so do you think that the cost of protecting yourself against a market downturn, do you think the price of options in some instances? Yeah, the, quite the price, when you say the price of options. Are getting very expensive. Well, okay, that's the point is if you're using the wrong model, I have two answers. One is we've been told that the price of option is expensive as we started. So, I mean, I started trading in finance in the 80s, and I was told before 87 that the price of options were expensive. Why? Because someone uses a stupid model, again, MBA classes, black shoals, all that nonsense. They price an option, and they say, well, it's a, they have the wrong model. If you have the wrong model, you're going to get the wrong price of options. So 99% of the time when people tell me the options are expensive, we look at them and we laugh, all right? They're not, not on our model. And, and we <laughs> used our model for a long time. And the 1% of the time when the options are expensive, we go find some other options that are not expensive. So it's not like all options uh, are expensive, like saying, oh, Miami is a rich town. Not all people are rich. Or someone says this country is poor, not all people are poor. So you have to look, there's diversity in the option market and, and in a way you can express a bet. Before I open it up to questions, before this conversation. This so let me, let, me, let me say one thing, because again, I don't wanna close on a sour note. That's what I was gonna ask you. You promised me that we, could, we would be positive at the end yeah, of this, not all I'm black. I'm gonna be months. positive, but not in the financial domain. I'm so sorry. <laughs> so I'm gonna make you feel better with the following. All right, that I'm, I'm working on, on a new uh, idea, and I mean, new, new book, and within that book, there's a chapter on that wedge between the perception and reality. So at no point in time have people complained more about racial equality, about discrimination, about gender inequality, all of that. At no point in time have we had more better condition than today. And, it's, and that's the Tocqueville effect. The more people complain about tyranny, the more democracy you get. And so byproduct of complaints, right? Because when people don't complain, they don't know things are wrong. So, Samash? Ah, button, okay, I'm pushing a button, all right. No. So, so, so this is, so in the social and political domain, people complain a lot because there's Twitter. And on Twitter, you hear a lot of things. So you say, oh, we live on a tyranny and stuff like that. At no point in time in history of mankind have we had more freedom. Government cannot be intrusive. Think of the FBI during J. Edgar Hoover or the McCarthy era. And people weren't complaining as much as today about tyranny. So there's one thing that's going on <laughs> that that mechanism of complaints is actually helping improve these conditions very fast. But well, do you think people believe those liberties are fragile? Do you think that that's the root of those complaints? Well, I, I think that the way the you, the way Ukraine played out, the way I don't think that that our liberties are fragile. To the contrary, something we see more and more evidence that the world is improving in that sense. So I know financially it's not good, right? But in the so in the socio social and political domain, things are a lot better than they were before. Questions for Nassim? Does anybody have any? <clears throat> One back there. And another in front. <clears throat> Hi, thanks um, for the different kind of explanations. Can we talk about a little bit um, of liquidity and how liquidity gets here, how it gets um, extracted out of the market and QT. So you're you're talking about the uh, the tumor, and um, yes, I still would talk about the the liquidity bubble. So um, as liquidity gets like um, extracted out of the market, what is your perception of what that has on as the in fact um, on the on the yield curve? I mean, I, 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 uh, 
I'm not thinking in terms of a yield curve, but I'm thinking in terms of the real uh, problem, saying, saying the effect of what's going on in crudity, how it changes the yield curve. Um, the fact is a premium for liquidity gives you a higher yield in the front. I have no idea how the yield curve will play out. There's two levels of liquidity. One is yield curve liquidity. And the second one is the, the real thing. In other words, you have a hold where you can't find the money because nobody wants to give you the money, not because there's no liquidity. And and I think that's a mechanism by which uh, systems collapse. So in other words, we can't, it's beyond talking about liquidity. When you have a Ponzi, it's not a matter, it's not, it didn't collapse because it was liquidity. It collapsed because it was fragile. Ponzi's are fundamentally fragile and we have a lot of Ponzi-like characteristics to markets that will succumb to that. There was another question in the back. Um, yeah, at some point you said uh, valuations are the, the weirdest they've ever been. What? You know, before last say 20 years, price to earnings was something, a number you could grasp, okay? Today is like all over the line. Because there are no earnings. Because sometimes there are no earnings, so it's infinite. Price to earnings is infinite. And, and, and that is a modern accident, an accident of history. It's not something that's sustainable. We had no idea how to value companies. It's mostly narratives and stories about the future to raise money so you can sell to someone else. I mean, think of the number of people who made a lot of money in venture capital off of companies that ended up making no money. Because someone got stuck with that, with that bill at the end of the meal. So th this is what I mean by, by, by these crazy valuations. They're, they're not, they're, I mean, the you know, when you have negative earnings and, and high valuation, it has worked for some companies. Some companies manage to have crazy earnings, crazy uh, PE ratios, and then eventually earnings rally. But the great majority are now in the cemetery of companies. <laughs> gone. We have any more questions for Nassim? One up here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Hi. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, I wanted to ask, given your involvement, so I have a private wealth lens. So I want to caveat with that with the personal taxes att attached to the clients that I serve um, at a very large investment bank. But um, I have, we have a lot of guidance from people who came from NYU, who teach at NYU. I actually went to NYU as well. So very strong tied to that. But um, given your philosophy of modern portfolio analysis and private wealth lens, like where do you think Universa fits into a portfolio of a multimillionaire family? Like where do you think that okay, fits I mean, in and does it fit in after taxes, okay. after fees? Okay, uh, two, uh, numerous things. The first thing is at NYU, I teach an engineering school, not in a finance school. Thank God, because I would have been murdered or poisoned. Yeah, sorry? You, sorry? She started at an engineering yeah, school. She switched engineering over to the dark side. Okay. <laughs> yes. Now, okay. Now, Universal, the way we tell people that we, it's not a portfolio story, Universal, you're not diversifying or not diversifying. It's something that pales you like insurance, is it an investment then? Portfolio. Then it is private wealth after taxes, after fees, or is it? You can barely hear this. Does Universa work for a high net worth individual versus an institution? Does it yeah, work? even more than an institution. But let me tell you why. Because high net worth individual decides on her or his own portfolio, whereas institutions have employees. And employees have a different payoff structure. So the employee is less likely to want to protect for tail events than an individual 
whose money is on the line. So if her or his money is on the line, they would make much more rational decision and they would understand what we do for a living. From my experience, people's own money is there. I prefer this. One more for the night more. up here. I think somebody at the sorry because the acoustics. first table had a question. First table. Thanks uh, for a wonderful evening. Question in your model, how do you evaluate or what factors do you give to geopolitical risk? You mentioned Ukraine. There was a phenomenal article written the other day about the US and China moving into 2024 and 25 with the presidential elections. When you're looking at your model and your factors. Zero, zero, zero. zero. We, we have no so factor in China. No, I tell you. War, we, war or anything else. No, we just value options unconditionally, regardless of the environment. Because you have to remember that there's, we, we don't believe that the stories and the environment are predictive of what, what's going to happen. See, so we'll just look at the difference between valuation and option price. That's it independently. We'll, we'll just talk, tell you whether we believe it's going to be great or we believe that uh, Putin is going to, uh, you know, have vodka and get angry and do something. Same result, same portfolio. 